All right, guys, first of all, uh, I want you all to know I lost a dollar bet on this tonight because I didn't think there'd be this many people here, but I am very, very pleased to lose the dollar. Um, thanks for coming out. This is not a political event. I'm going to stress it till the cows come home. This is not a political event. It's an idea on ways to use the ARPA money to make the city of Fall River a better place to live. We're going to move right along, and I'm also going to apologize because I have, I'm double booked. I have a school committee meeting tonight. I'm going to stay for as long as I can. And then I'm going to go to the school committee meeting because we have a very heavy agenda in executive session that I have to be there for. And again, I apologize, but I'm going to stay as long as I can. I have um, um, Mary Sahadi and Tim McCoy who will aptly take notes along with Elena so I know exactly what's being said and this is also being filmed. First of all, let me introduce the panel. Uh, this is the panel that meets together to do exactly the same thing you're going to do tonight. Kick around ideas on how to spend the ARPA money. Uh, to the right, I have Tim McCoy, City Administrator, Paul Furlan, Water and Gas, Jim Carey, um, <laughs> Liberty, Tatiana Rock, President of Liberty, Mary Sahadi, the Chief Financial Officer, Jim Pimentel, Bricklayers Union, Debbie Fastino, Coalition for Social Justice, Natalie Mello, Bank Street Neighborhood Association, uh, Ken Fiola, Bristol County Eco Economic Development Council, uh, Chris uh, Peckham, City Council, Carl Hetzler, H&M in the Industrial Park, and Mike O'Sullivan, President of the Chamber. These guys have been working diligently, and they're going to listen to your concerns tonight. So the next meeting, we can kick them around. I do want to make one thing known right now. The first idea we sunk money into with the ARPA funds was the Operation Compass, which came to us from the City Council. They had a good idea on how to strengthen public safety in the city. That's what we're looking for. Ideas like that that we can use together to make Fall River safer and a better place to live. With that, I'm going to ask um, Elena to tell us who's first on the sign-in list. Oh, oh, I'm sorry, Mary, my mistake. Mary's going to run through this brief presentation. Thank you, everyone. Thank you again for everyone being here this evening. Um, as the mayor indicated, this is a working group um, that we work with, the panel, that's advisory panel. We work with them on a regular basis with regard to the spending of the ARPA money. And we are having you all here this evening so we can gain some additional ideas of where you would like to see the city spend and invest some of the $69 million of ARPA money, American Rescue Plan Act money, that was granted to us by the U.S. Treasury. So thank you to President Biden for supporting this bill and bringing this bill forward to us. Um, the first screen, and I, Elena did not give me a copy of the screen, so I'm going to just kind of turn around every once in a while, but the first screen that was presented to you this evening is a screen that indicates the total $1.9 trillion. So you can see from the arrow on the screen, the local, state and local portion of it is the portion that we're talking about this evening. So we're talking about the <clears throat> $69 million that has been awarded to the city of Fall River. Now that award is coming to us in two separate um, payments. The first payment was received on June 1st of this year, 2021. It was for $34 million. And the second payment will be we will be receiving one year from that date, so June 1, 2022, is when we're expecting the second payment of $34 million. <clears throat> With the $34 million, <clears throat> that particular money has come to us with eligibility criteria, right? So every grant we get, this is federal money, it will be subject to our single audit act, and it's coming to us with <clears throat> criteria that we need to look at and analyze and be able to spend our dollars in the, that particular criteria. And the criteria originally was set up into five buckets. It was set up into the bucket of public health and expenditures, and we'll talk about that a little bit further on one of the additional screens. Um, <clears throat> it was set up to address the negative economic impact that was caused by this public health pandemic, this emergency that we had. So we have a category called negative economic impact. In addition, <clears throat> there's a 
payment or a place, a placeholder, if you will, to replace lost revenue. So every municipality throughout the United States lost revenue during the pandemic. Simple examples of the lost revenue are things like meals tax, right? We lost meals tax. The restaurants were all closed. We are, some of our local receipts are based on meals tax and we lost meals tax as a result of that. We lost parking meter receipts. Those are two very simple ones that, that everyone can really get their arms around in terms of local receipts that we lost in terms of the revenue. In addition, although the state aid for education increased during the pandemic, the education or the state aid for general unrestricted aid was pretty flat. So we were fortunate not necessarily to lose state aid, but we didn't have the increases that we would have expected to have as we've had each and every year um, from the Commonwealth. And so that would fall into the category called replacement of loss public sector revenue. There's a section called premium pay. That particular section is a section where um, we're allowed to <clears throat> pay people a premium, if you will, um, a stipend, in addition to their payroll for work they did during the pandemic. Um, and generally the work would be done as a result of <clears throat> working during the um, public health crisis, right? So it's going to be for people who are out there working during the public health crisis, your public safety individuals, your sanitation individuals, um, the frequently asked questions go on and talk about your health departments, they talk about your grocery stores, people that, that needed to be out there and work during the pandemic. Um, the government has allowed for a provision called premium pay. There we go, keep going. <laughs> um, and then the last category um, that we are allowed to spend um, some of our OPER money in is the investment in water and sewer and broadband infrastructure. So if Elena goes back a, a slide, we started um, talking about the $34 million that we received initially and the $34 million that we will receive um, in a year from now. What <clears throat> I didn't mention here um, with regard to um, the reporting requirements is like any other federal grant that we will receive, we are going to receive um, a requirement from the federal government that's going to require us to report to them where the city of Fall River is expending um, those dollars on a quarterly basis. And <clears throat> It'll be broken down into a number of categories, what's been requested. So, you know, here we're having individuals that may be requesting areas that we may include as part of our requested ARPA money. We will also have those monies that have been obligated. So the executive branch of government has obligated to the use of the ARPA money in certain areas, and then we'll report on where it is, has actually been expended. Um, <clears throat> We can't use it on pension funds. We can't use it on debt service. Um, we can't use it on legal settlements. So, so the government is pretty clear that this money is provided to us to deal with the lost revenue, deal with the public health pandemic issues that every community had throughout the United States um, during the pandemic. And it goes from the period of time of March of 2021 all the way to December of 2024. So that's going to be our fiscal 25 um, year end. Okay, how about the, okay. So here um, are a couple of charts that we put together, this particular chart and the next chart. It'll give you some ideas of those five categories that I just spoke about. So the revenue loss, of course, um, I talked about the lost revenue in particular as it relates to um, local receipts, but it also includes an area called rehiring of staff. Last year, because of the pandemic, if you listen to any of the budget um, deliberation meetings, we talked extensively at eliminating all of the vacant positions that were included in the budget because there were so many uncertainties and so many unknowns. This particular provision within <clears throat> the opera money will allow us to rehire 
or restaff those positions that we eliminated from the prior year budget, and it includes not only their annual salary, but it also includes any benefits that the city would pay these individuals, so their health care as well as their pension. <clears throat> The employee premium pay, um, again, we, we, we talked about that shortly. That is, that is one of the areas that is allowed. It's generally going to be allowed to those people that were at the most risk during the, um, <clears throat> the pandemic. The federal government in the frequently asked questions is referring it to it as the critical infrastructure sectors. So um, there'll be some further guidance from the US Treasury as to what the critical infrastructure sectors really means, but in terms of the actual bill itself, that is the sector that it will be allowed to receive premium pay. It also will allow us to provide grants um, to employers as well. <clears throat> the negative impact, um, where was the negative impact? Travel, tourism, hospitality, all of these areas can be funded with the opera money. So we can utilize um, some of the opera money for any one of these categories. So if anyone has any ideas tonight, we are certainly all ears for anyone's ideas. You all have um, a worksheet in front of you to um, rate the ideas that are listed there, but certainly the back half of that is lined paper. Um, we certainly want to hear everybody's ideas with regard to how they see the best use of this opera money for our city. <clears throat> we can have aid to households in the negative impact section, aid to nonprofits, as well as small businesses. Um, public health, um, a lot of it is similar, right? It's the COVID-19 mitigation effects. So this is very similar to the CARES money that we received earlier in the year. It also includes medical expenses um, and certain other public and safety staff. So, We've got some areas there that we can utilize um, mental health services, substance um, use services, and certainly other health services as well. Um, <clears throat> infrastructure. Um, the infrastructure is very limited at the moment. So we were hoping um, when the bill first went to Congress that it would have been expanded to include more areas of infrastructure. But when the bill got signed by the president, it was very limited. So it's limited right now to water to sewer <clears throat> and to broadband. So um, there's some limitations on those projects. Um, Mr. Furlan has been working. He's our <clears throat> director of um, the Department of Community Utilities, and he has been working um, with us with regard to projects that um, he would like to see um, using some of these fundings. <clears throat> um, services to dis Proportionate impact, those disproportionately impacted. So if this is going to be an area that's going to require some additional expansion by the U.S. Treasury in terms of the frequently asked questions. But <clears throat> one of the areas that we've talked about as a group is, is youth services, right? Um, an area that we can <clears throat> certainly um, provide um, the youth of this community with some additional services that they may not have been um, ha or had an advantage to take advantage of, but with these monies, they, they certainly can. Um, <clears throat> some of it is overlapping with monies that other agencies are receiving. So we've got the school department receiving monies. Um, some of it in terms of the early learning might be overlapping with them. And then certainly an entire category called housing, some of those components <clears throat> would necessarily um, also overlap with um, Mr. Dion from the Department of um, yeah, how, Community Development, thank you. Community Development. Um, so he can't cover any mortgage um, payments, but he does have the ability for um, <clears throat> rent aid um, as well as utility aid and in some instances other housing assistance. So those are basically our categories that we're um, allowed to expend the ARPA money in. What I can tell you is <clears throat> the U.S. Treasury continues to provide frequently asked questions, and so they're providing us with um, any one of the states within the United States are providing questions almost on a daily basis, and they are taking those under consideration 
and they're providing us with a document called the Frequently Asked Questions on a, on a pretty much regular basis. Um, in addition, the mayor and um, his staff is regularly listening to webinars that are coming out of um, the U.S. <coughs> Conference of Mayors, um, as well as locally with um, what's referred to as the Mass Municipal Association. <coughs> Um, the GFOA, that's the Government Finance um, <clears throat> Offices Association. Um, again, you know, big picture, don't use the money to, um, or avoid creating programs that are gonna be long-term, that they were, we're gonna need to future, need to fund past the time frame. Um, you know, rebuild the financial flexibility and stability, that's the use of the lost revenue component of the bill, <clears throat> you know, consider um, regional and or other partnerships, and then certainly um, use other dedicated um, funds first. So in our case, we received $7.9 million worth of CARES money. We are going to spend down the remaining of that CARES money. Um, that needs to be spent down by December 31, 2021, and we will be spending down the remaining of that um, really before we are dedicating any of these dollars. But as the mayor said earlier, and one of the ideas very early on um, was this concept called operational um, compass that was provided to um, the city council. The city council was um, in favor of operation compass and we are implementing um, that program with some of the monies that are in the category called negative um, economic impact for purposes of um, the chief and going forward with his program. And, you know, where are we going from here? I mean, this is something that nobody really expected. Nobody expected the pandemic. Nobody really expected um, to receive all of these dollars that we're receiving. So we've got a nice group of people here that are volunteering their time um, to come to meetings. We have all of you that are here today. So we'd like to take back all of your ideas. Um, we'd like to strategize them, put them, you know, put all the results in, in a format so that we can see what everyone really would like to see the city spend and expend these dollars on what is best for the city going forward. So um, with that, I think I'll give it back to the mayor wherever I see him. Where did he go? Did he leave us? Ah, he left. Okay, so I'm going to give it to, to um, <clears throat> Mr. McCoy, he's our city administrator, and he will take it from here. If anyone has any questions, we will certainly be happy to um, answer whatever questions individuals might have this evening. Any questions for me, at least? Yes. Infrastructure guidelines, does that not include sidewalks and streets at this moment? It does not include sidewalks and streets, but again, trying to be as creative as possible. Um, working with Mr. Furlan, we are going, I'm sorry, working with Mr. Furlan, we are going to attempt to um, coordinate with the street department those streets that need to be done, as well as the water and or sewer that needs to be done. So we'll do the street that needs to be done with that. The sidewalks may be a little bit of a challenge in the same area because they are not part of the infrastructure definition in the bill. City services, as a, as a phrase, it's, it's fairly vague. What's the, what's the specifics to how you can spend on city services? Um, so city services, you can really spend the money on really any city service that does not include the debt payment, the pension payment, <clears throat> um, any legal settlements. So for an example, you could spend it on all of public safety um, in terms of supporting the budget. So it's, a, it's a, an area of the revenue replacement. But not community maintenance. Community maintenance, yes, any department because it's really supporting the budget. So if you recall this past year with our budget, um, we supported the budget with um, a little over four and a half million dollars worth of opera money, and we supported it in the category <coughs> called revenue loss, and that was to provide city services, right? Services that we are including in the budget, whether they be financial, whether they be community maintenance, whether they be <coughs> um, public safety, it's any department 
um, that's included in the budget, excluding, of course, water and sewer and EMS, which are all included um, in enterprise funds. Any other questions? Okay. Hi, everybody. Good evening. My name's Tim McCoy. I want to thank all of you for coming out tonight. Um, this is impressive. Uh, I greatly appreciate it. Uh, and I'd like to let everybody know, um, just very, very briefly, but uh, your opinions and your suggestions will be considered. So right now at this point, you know, your voice is just as important as my voice or the mayor's or any sort of elected official. If you have an idea that is good for the neighborhoods and the community in the city of, of Fall River, um, it will be considered. So again, I appreciate having all of you here. Uh, we have, um, I think we have 18 speakers signed up and just want to remind everybody that we are giving uh, three minutes per speaker. Obviously, if you're mid-thought, I'm not going to cut you off. I'm going to be respectful um, and let you finish your thought. But I'm asking if we can have those who signed up do their best uh, to be courteous and respectful and stay to the three minutes. We can get everyone in here and still, you know, wrap up by 7.30, which, again, the Our Lady of Light and, and Mr. Rodericks, uh, Our Lady of Light organization have been kind enough to, uh, to lend us the hall from 6 to 7.30. So if we can, please uh, be mindful of the, um, of the three minute time frame. I'm gonna ask Elena to please, uh, to please uh, time each speaker. So I have two sheets. I don't know which sheet was, was was first, Patrick's, okay, so I have page one here. Uh, so we're gonna read them off in the order uh, that the uh, our, uh, citizens and interested parties had signed in. So the first name I have is Mr. Patrick Norton. If you wish, you got it. All right, thanks everybody. Thanks for having the meeting. Thanks for caring about this. My name is Patrick Norton. I'm the executive director of the Narrow Center for the Arts and also a member of the Four of Arts and Culture Coalition. And I'm, I'm, let me just preface my remarks. I'm not here to lobby money for the Narrow Center for the Arts. We've done very well. We just got a big federal grant. So my, I am here to speak, I'm not on behalf of the arts organizations in Fall River, but on behalf of the arts in Fall River. Uh, I, I'm somewhat familiar with these ARPA funds and it, you'd be hard pressed to find any industry that was impacted harder than the arts and culture industry. Most of the venues had to be closed 14 to 16 months, no revenue whatsoever. Um, so I think that fits into the uh, ARPA funds. I can tell you that from my experience with the arts, it's an economic development engine for the city of Fall River. For every dollar that's spent on the arts, there's a $9 spin-off. So if you come to a show with the Narrows, there's a good chance you go into Edith Sagra's restaurant. If you go into the Children's Museum, there's a good chance you go in for a, to a restaurant up the street or staying in a hotel. I also want to talk about the quality of life issues in Fall River, and I know this is something that came up on the a screen as well. The arts are a really integral part of this community, and I think we've seen coming out of COVID that many of the nonprofits and arts communities have really banded together to provide some great, fun things for the community. And I think that, um, you know, spending some money, I'm going to put a dollar figure, and I'd like to see the committee spend between half a million dollars or 250000 to a half a million dollars divided amongst, divided up equally amongst the arts organizations so that small organizations get the same as big. And I think it would be a real jolt in the arm, and I think it would be something that um, the city of Fall River talks about economic development and, and bringing back these downtowns. Well, I think it's super important that the arts be a part of that. We've seen that happen in many cities. And I can tell you the arts in Fall River, I don't know what the line item in the city of Fall River budget is, but I think it's zero. I could be wrong on that for arts and culture, so this may be an opportunity for the city to get in the arts and culture business, like many cities and towns across this commonwealth the United States have. So thank you for your time and effort, and uh, have a great night. Thank you, Patrick. Um, and again, anyone, who, uh, anyone on this list, if you prefer to use the microphone or if you want to speak right from your chair, uh, feel free. The next individual I have who is signed in is Patty Rico. Good evening, everybody. Good evening. 
Um, my name is Patty Rigo. I am the district director for Viva Fall River, which is um, a new initiative that is dedicated to the revitalization of the city. Um, I think, you know, one of the things that we're going to hear tonight, there's no shortage of issues, no shortage of ideas, but there's definitely, um, you know, a capacity issue. Uh, which I'm going to address in one second, but um, I'm also looking um, to give an idea that I'm not just thinking about handouts, I'm thinking about how the city can make a greater investment in the city and also get their big, the biggest return on investment. Um, and so I'm um, dedicated to um, small business support, arts and culture in the city, and community involvement. And I'm looking for some seed funding for Viva Fall River, which um, would assist with a three to five year campaign, an on-ramp for revitalization, tourism, and arts and culture. This would definitely be contingent on matching funds, and that's what I mean by an investment, in investing in organizations that are committed to the long run. Viva Fall River means long live Fall River, and our initiative is definitely here for the long run. Um, we would, um, we want to incubate new capacity under the condition that we would seek the, ne the necessary revenue streams, community support, and partnerships that would make us sustainable. So I know that was one of the contingencies is, um, you know, not just investing in things that are, you know, short term. We're in this for the long term for sure. Investing in Viva Fall River would help establish a model that could provide a mechanism to address other neighborhoods and commercial corridors while building program capacity where there's already momentum, such as um, downtown management. Um, tourism and public art and small business support. And on that note, um, I also think that creating a small business fund to attract and incentivize new startups would be a wonderful thing for the city. We have a lot of vacancies and um, we have a very diverse population that would love to have some diverse businesses to represent them. Um, this fund should be leveraged, leveraged again with other financial partners, so seeking private funding to bolster whatever investment that the city would give. And so um, this fund could help with business, restaurant, and retail incubators, startup funds for new businesses, and maker spaces and collaborative workspaces. And last, um, as I mentioned earlier, we are going to hear some great ideas tonight, but you know, it's not about ideas, it's about having the talented and um, capable people to make those ideas come to life. So um, I'm, it's my belief that the future of Fall River and other gateway cities will depend largely on its ability to hire talented policymakers, administrators, and program coordinators, as well as train local youth for good careers in public service. That means attracting them from outside the city and also cultivating them from within. We have a lot of great people here. We need to keep them here, keep their passion in this city. I'm one of those people. <laughs> I left for 20 years and now I'm back and I want to bring all that experience and expertise to the city and just show the love that I have for the city. Um, investing in new staff for city departments, especially planning, economic development, and community maintenance would really help to provide an infrastructure for people like myself who have ideas to come and be able to um, partner with the city and have successful initiatives come to life. Um, thank you for your time, appreciate it. Next on the list is Alexander Silva. Sorry. Hi, everyone. <laughs> Alexander Silva, 263 Pine Street. Um, I just coming to say that I think the city should spend the funds, or should focus the funds rather, on community improvements that naturally benefit the residents while also creating as much additional revenue and economic development as possible. Some ideas of this could be, I was going to say sidewalk and street improvements designed to expand outdoor dining for restaurants and businesses, particularly North Main Street, South Main Street, and Pleasant Street come to mind. But uh, with like, you know, the sewer infrastructure that could easily be paired with it by adding open space or just reconfigurating existing sidewalks and streets above it after the work is done. Uh, the city could purchase new ci uh, city trolleys to expand resident access to city events and reduce traffic con congestion during those events. This would also provide revenue, uh, op opportunities for additional revenue by renting it out to other events and other organizations, private and such. Uh, improvements to park infrastructure to support and enhance community events would be a very good and wise place, especially since parks generally are stretched for their funding sources. Um, and I see Mr. Lima here, so I'm going to let him speak mostly to this, but I think the city could add new downtown open space and green space with an eye to expanding the Quickishan Rail Trail to the waterfront, 
which would be an extremely impactful economic driver, not to mention, uh, well, so these are some things that are, once done, will offer lasting public health benefits to residents, especially after the COVID pandemic, while also requiring minimal maintenance uh, on the city's part and a chance to add new revenue by both direct and indirect means. Thank you. Alexander Silva. Thank you. Thank you, Alex. Uh, next on the list is Sandra Carrero. I can speak from here. Sure. Thank you. So good evening, everyone. My good name, evening. My name is Sandra Carrero, and I'm a community organizer for United Interfaith Action here in Fall River. We work with all faith-based combinations on social and economic justice issues. Um, we are also working very closely with the Fall River Public Schools uh, on the use of the ESSER money, the $64 million that the schools are receiving, and we did an intensive um, survey with parents, teachers, and staff, and students um, to get some input on where they would like to see that money uh, we, uh, be spent on, and we uh, are actually having a meeting tomorrow with the interns to bring in around that. So we are very glad to be here and part of this community input. And we would like to share um, and offer our input on, especially on three um, um, areas of improvement in our city. Uh, to be aware that this input is not just something that came up from conversations between us and um, our leaders, but it was based on an intensive listening that we did with people from Fall River in like a period of three months in the winter. So these um, areas came from the listening that we did. <clears throat> so the three areas are housing, immigration, and public safety. In terms of housing, I would also like to take this moment to um, thank Mayor Coogan for um, putting aside $1.5 million and uh, uh, sharing that last week um, for a housing crisis. So we've heard that is is there's a big need for creation of more affordable housing and housing stability, uh, especially with uh, the end of the moratorium foreclosure and evictions that is happening, that is going to take place in the end of this month, and a lot to do with homelessness. <coughs> in terms of immigration, this has been an issue that we've been working on uh, since 2018. It's very dear to us and to our community. Uh, we need more accessible and affordable ESOL classes. So Jobs for Progress is the only institution in uh, Fall River that does classes for free for uh, immigrants, and they have a waiting list of around 200 people. So we would like investment to be done to be able to uh, get those people to get uh, classes and be able to communicate in the city that they live in. Uh, we need more legal aid for immigrants, especially undocumented, that are often taken advantage of. I would like to ask Odette, one of our leaders, who will share a little bit about the uh, other priority, which is public safety. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Odette, and I am also a member of UIA. And uh, just to piggyback on what Sandra mentioned, the concerns that I am about to share was exactly a product of research done in the community. And this research is done, okay, on listening. We listen to parents, we listen to teachers, we listen to administrations, we, ne we listen to youth. And so these are uh, some of the concerns. Uh, so uh, funding for more community peace. Keeping programs, okay, for the crisis team for the mental health calls or for transformative justice programs. Youth programming, engage youth and address concerns of youth and youth violence. This is super important that came on top of our list, okay, from the listening that we did. We, UIA leaders, will be continuing, okay, conducting the listening research uh, throughout the community to learn more about the community needs and to be able, okay, to make, okay, a more detailed proposals to the mayor and to the co community or government officials. Thank you. 
I would just like to add one more thing. Sure. So um, one of the things that we would like to get funding for is we've been um, advocating for training for officers in different languages, uh, Portuguese, Spanish, and Khmer. Uh, we had officers done training in Spanish. Um, we would like to see uh, more officers doing this training. So it's a training on conversational dialogue to, and culture to be able to communicate with our immigrant community. So we would love to get funding for that, and we've been in contact with Chief uh, Cardoza on that, and uh, we would like to uh, forward that in the next year. Thank you. Thank you, Sandra. Thank you, Olga. Um, Unless it, I've, I've just been informed by uh, the folks here recording for uh, Fall River Reporter that um, it would be beneficial if you could come up and use the microphone because they can't hear you. The phone will not pick up if you're speaking from the chair. So uh, if that's a problem uh, for anyone, I'd be more than happy to read your suggestions. Um, or you could still, if you wish, uh, you know, speak from your chair. It's just uh, it, it would be helpful. Uh, for those who will be watching uh, via live streaming and whatnot. I also, while we have this little brief interruption, I want to encourage everyone and remind everyone to please complete your surveys. And if for some reason during this exchange of ideas and this uh, uh, brainstorming uh, uh, event here, please feel free to use the comment section uh, with your surveys if something comes up, whether it's you've already spoke or whether you prefer not to speak, but please take advantage of that outlet also to uh, to offer any ideas you may have. Uh, the next individual on my list is Mr. Alfred Lima. Mr. Lima, are you comfortable coming up, or you want to? Uh, yeah, I'll come up. All right. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, maybe right through here. Sure. Thanks, Mr. Lima. And I have uh, some comments here for the, uh, the committee. Oh, sure. Okay. Yeah, the committee. Yeah. My, name, my name is uh, Alfred Lima. I'm a community activist uh, involved now with the, uh, uh, the Fall River uh, Bike Committee. And uh, there's a few things that I would like to recommend. I'd like to re recommend something which is related to uh, indoor recreation in the city and making the city a better place for everyone. Um, and those, the, the two things we'd like to recommend are uh, two bike path uh, proposals, one of which is the Mount Hope Bay Greenway, and the other is the South Watampa Pond Greenway. And they both go along the, the shoreline of those, those, those two uh, uh, ponds. Um, but um, the, the thing is with, with the, the bike paths, we have, there's three, sort of uh, categories, you might say. There's the, there's the, uh, the um, feasibility study, and then there's the, the planning and, and engineering study, and then there's the construction. So there's three phases. And the um, feasibility study has already been paid by the Community Preservation Act, and uh, so that more or less is taken care of. And the construction will be taken care of by state and federal funds uh, that, that will be available to the city. But there, there is one, one critical point that we need to, to make, and that's we need funds for the, um, the design of, of the construction. And we don't have that funds available, and that's something which we really do need. Um, it will take uh, quite a bit of funds, more than the city has available, I think, to make this happen. But uh, the state and, and federal uh, governments require this of the localities that they basically chip in their their amount. So uh, again, this is something related to travel and tourism, something related to COVID-19, because really bike paths are great for having people come out and you know uh, be outdoors and, and not not be in too close uh, proximity to other people. So it's a uh, bike paths are a great thing, great recreation. Uh, these will both be focused on the south end of the city uh, where there is a great need for uh, additional recreational facilities. So um, again, thank you again for your
Next on the list is City Council of Trotley. Thank you. Uh, very rarely do we have an opportunity to uh, bring down costs. Every time we, every time I take a seat uh, on the City Council, we're always talking about how costs are going up. Um, we have an opportunity here with the sewer infrastructure to uh, make an investment in uh, a couple of things, actually. Uh, I'm not an expert on sewer you know, information. However, I do, have done some reading. Uh, I've looked at some other towns. Um, there's uh, turbines that can go inside your sewer pipes to generate electricity and help bring down electricity costs, for example. Um, but I think that we have an opportunity to uh, you know, speak with Mr. Furlan, uh, see his ideas on what we can do to bring down um, the costs of, uh, of sewer water. And, and in this case, in Fall River's case, we pay, we pay a rainwater tax as well, which is just incredible. I'm sure a lot of people can't, can't believe that we have to, have to pay that, uh, or fee, I should say. So we, we have opportunities here to uh, see what we can do. And there's, a, there's one specific thing that I know for a fact that we can definitely bring down. Um, our sewage was, at one point in time, uh, managed in the city. Um, then we lost that ability, and we went from an $800,000 cost, which is high on its own, uh, to $2 million um, cost. And that's, that's basically because we have to take our sewage and ship it out to, I believe it's Cranston or some other um, areas around. And that increase right there is one of the major reasons why sewer rates are going up. So I think, I believe that um, Ms. Rigo, um, I believe that uh, the Dennis's, I believe Mr. Lima, I believe a lot of people have great ideas for economic development and tourism, and we need that. We definitely need that in our city. Um, but we also need to take a focus at what we're doing for costs and how much it costs, because that's gonna have an effect on people buying homes in the city. And that is really uh, one of the bigger um, pitches that we need to see uh, improve in the city is people buying property, investing in property, and um, wanting to live in the city. Um, and, and it's all connected together. I mean, I, we do need those arts and we do need those economic development ideas as well. But we also need to understand that if we're making it more expensive to live in Fall River, it's really going to, uh, you know, it's going to be an anchor on us. Uh, the other piece and, and that we have a great opportunity on, and the, the City Council was a part of it already as far as investing in public safety, uh, we have an opportunity to improve our camera system. Um, we have an opportunity to expand on that. Uh, there was a very violent uh, situation that occurred on uh, 5th Street and, and, and next to uh, the, the green, uh, you know, the park out in that way. And um, it was, it was, it wasn't for, if it wasn't for cameras, if it wasn't for, uh, you know, that part of it, we wouldn't have even known uh, who was involved in that process. So um, all around the city, there's, we, we have, we, we're very limited as to what we have for, for personnel, for police. We don't have eyes everywhere. We need a comprehensive camera system in order to really uh, get a hold as, uh, of what's going on in our city. And we have an opportunity to make that investment. We were given some information uh, from the city council that um, some cameras are being fixed, but I really think we need to have a heavier investment in that. Um, and when we, when we have a safer city, when we have a better eyes on the city, we can start to do that investment in youth and arts and things like that that we need that's gonna make the city expand bigger. So that's all I have, thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, next on the list is Chris Aguiar. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Uh, how's it going, everybody? Um, my name is Chris Aguiar. I'm known as your boy Loco. I'm a YouTuber, I'm a rapper, and I am a community activist, and I'm not a good public speaker, so bear with me. Um, I basically um, just wanted to give my input on um, overall life in the city. Um, <clears throat> I'm a lifelong resident of 38, so I've been here a couple of decades now, and um, to me, the city is the same when I was a kid. Um, safety, it's a little bit better, but um, it's just an old town, and it, there's no reason why we, we are in this limbo and we're not moving forward, um, in my opinion, as a resident. I know we got new businesses, um, we get the train coming in now, but it's just the same old boring town. I, I leave, I go to New Bedford, I go to Bristol, I go to these other places. Um, for their um, recreational, um, you know, uh, areas and activities. So that's basically what I wanted to um, add in. So my first suggestion, 
Growing up in the uh, city, not having guidance um, as a kid, I did a lot of uh, the wrong stuff, gangs, drugs, all of the above. Um, there is a, a, a place here called Fort River Recreation that I believe needs to be granted the sky because that was a great place when it was at the Bank Street Armory. Uh, it was packed. And now I think that place is uh, very, um, I don't want to say it's a ghost town, but it's just this tiny building they're in. It's not, I, don't, I, think, I think they deserve a big building. Um, if, and, uh, and I also believe that uh, children that can't get there uh, should get transportation somehow from the city, free transportation. Which, uh, so maybe that can be done, or maybe a whole new rec center can be done, preferably in my neighborhood, Corky Row, where there's a lot of people that can't, uh, <clears throat> that they're just outside in the neighborhood doing the wrong things. And if you, if you get them young in uh, recreational centers, it, it gets them uh, on a better path. And uh, with the transportation part, I think that needs to be a part of it. I know we've talked about it in some meetings, and I, I don't see it happening yet. So things like Fall River Falcons, things like anything that is Fall River based, should be free or close to free, and transportation should definitely be free. So that's my one thing is with the youth. The second thing is uh, families, young families. I don't think there's anything really, uh, there's no big, big place in this city for young families. Um, and I might be re reaching really far, but we have a place called Dave's Beach, and it's not a beach. If you go to towns, maybe Lowell, Worcester, where they don't have access to oceans, they turn their ponds into beaches. They put sand there, they put volleyball courts, they put basketball courts, they put cook, cookout areas. Um, you got about 60 uh, Central American uh, residents who go to Pulaski Park and play volleyball on concrete. Uh, why don't we have something down at Dave's Beach? We got plenty of area there. We can move it away from the ramp, design that area up. Um, you can get rid of some of the people who are sleeping in the woods there too. Um, I don't, and that's my next, my next uh, thing. So I think Dave's Beach should actually be a beach. I shouldn't have to go to New Bedford beaches. I shouldn't have to go to Bristol. If anyone's been to Bristol Cold State Park, when you go in on the right, they got basketball courts, they got volleyball courts, they got uh, cookout areas, they got sand, and they got water. We have that in Fall River. That will bring in a lot of people if we do it right, and that will, the businesses, the restaurants, they'll try our food, they'll shop at our plazas, our South Coast Plaza, our Walmart, whatever. They'll come here and spend money if they're down here in the city already for, for, for that area. My last thing is um, also on life in Fall River. As everybody knows, as you drive through the city, you see a lot of <clears throat> people on the corners. You see them in the neighborhoods, mostly my neighborhood, Corky Row, um, and they're homeless or they are doing whatever they're not living too good. And uh, them people, and, and plus new families who can't afford, you know, $800 a month for a one bedroom, um, I think there should be a program in the city that they have on the West Coast, which is a work for um, housing program. Um, so I've done interviews on my channel, Your Boy Loco TV, with plenty homeless, and they tell me that they're willing to work. They can't get jobs, they can't get IDs, they can't get a, that's another thing, IDs. Give them the uh, post office as an address. They can't get an ID because they don't have an address. If we, give, if we create a program like they have in California, I was looking it up, <clears throat> it's a work for housing program. You give them city jobs, they go out, they clean the neighborhood, whatever it is, you, got, you get them, and then they have a place to stay. That'd be, that we'd get them off the corners. The city would, we wouldn't have all this negative feedback, people driving by and making fun of us and saying we're, you know, we're a dump. And that, that's, that's the, that's what we have right now is, is people looking down on the city. So youth, big recreational, if it's not Dave Beach, put it somewhere and make it big and make it nice. And we'll have a lot of people come in here like they go to Newport, Bristol, New Bedford. And third, uh, let's uh, help uh, people who can't afford to live by putting them to work and making that their rent. Thank you. Your boy, Local TV. Ah. <laughs> Thank you, Chris. I only have a first name, Nelson. Took college courses of public speaking because uh, it's coming in handy today. Um, to Chotley's point with those cost increases, um, as we know, Fall River is facing 
is going to be faced with a lot of hard decisions that's going to be coming down the road. And what are those issues that's going to keep on increasing uh, costs in the city? You know, we have the South Coast Rail. That's going to make a huge increase into the cost of living in the city. We have water and sewer rates that are going up. We have the debt exclusion going up. Hard decisions are going to have to come down pretty soon. And the direction we take this year is, is going to make or break the city for the next three to four years, which is why it's so imperative to get this spending right with this money. Because this money was given to us to a, in, in a once in a lifetime opportunity through a different set of circumstances. And if we, get, if we make this investment wrong, it's going to cost us. So this November, the public's input will be coming. And I think my solution is very simple. We should, there should be no rush to spending these funds and let the real public input, the voters of who they want in the sixth floor to make so, those decisions. Because the one thing we, we, we don't want to do is just rush, spend his money, and not spend it wisely. So I think we ought to respect this, this time in our city's history and let the people speak as to who they want to lead the ship for the next two to three years. And I think we owe it to them, we owe it to the people who have sacrificed their lives, who have lost their lives to this virus. So it's only imperative that we just let the process play out this November. Thank you and have a good day. Thank you, Nelson. Uh, Mrs. Joanne Sprague. Thank you, good evening everyone. Thank you for having us here this evening. My name is Joanne Sprague. I'm a resident of Fall River. I'm the executive director of the Children's Museum of Greater Fall River and also an active founding member of the FRAC, um, which I am proud to be part of. Uh, the pandemic for the Children's Museum, like everybody else in the nonprofit world, uh, hurt us. Uh, fortunately, we were established enough that we were be able, able to get some PPP funds to keep my wonderful staff of two full-timers. We do what we can um, for the community, and we'd love to be able to do more outreach than we even do, but with a staff of three, it makes it very difficult to keep our doors open. A lot of the outreach that we do are with the local social, social service agencies. We provide discounts for our families with EBT cards, reduced from an $8 fee to a $3 fee. But the state, no one helps us out with subsidizing the other $5 that we lose. Um, and our numbers are great now, and we're happy to help every family that we help, including the Wonder Fund uh, for uh, children in foster care. We provide a discount it. Um, so we would love to be able to be reimbursed in some way. Uh, for some of the community outreach that we do um, in these difficult times. But on a broader base, um, through FRAC, uh, a lot of us have the same um, difficulties. And in museum, children's museum world, um, there are a couple of sayings. And one is that children's museums often become the town square. Um, and the other one is, if you build it, they'll come. People will walk if they're given something to walk to. In our city, it's a real problem because we have sections. You know, we have the waterfront, and then we have nothing to come up to North Main Street. Um, and in all the plans that are being done for downtown, our area of North Main Street is not included in. And we'd love to be able to include our end in as well. Um, and so those are some of the ideas. Someone already mentioned tonight the trolleys. How wonderful that would be to have trolleys that could take, you may have a family come into town and they want to be at the Children's Museum with the five and six year old and they have an 11 year old that wants to get to the battleship. That could be so easily done uh, in partnerships we could do if we had the transportation. So um, that is one area that I think would help a lot of us uh, in the area. So I thank you for your time and uh, we have a lot of work to do folks, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Sprague. Next on the list is John Furland.
Good evening. Good evening. I think you'll get a, a clue as to what I'm going to advocate for by my last name. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to advocate for sewer and water for the following reasons. If you've seen multimedia in the last couple of months, we see flooding, we see problems with sewers, and we see problems with drainage. This is not a new problem. It's a problem that's been here for years. We go back to the CSO program in the 80s when the CSO program was shoved down our throats by Conservation Law Foundation. And the government never gave us a dime. We went to Congress, we begged, we pleaded. We needed to pay for these systems. They never gave us a dime. One of the reasons our rates are so high now is because we have to pay for these systems. Now, being proactive, Mr. Sullivan, along with Mr. Phil, who's carrying it on now, developed a plan five years ago. I think it's actually started 10 years ago. But they developed a plan for the sewer to, to create a remedy for a flooding in the city. It was a $123 million plan. Right now, they have ongoing construction at the sewer treatment plant. They have ongoing construction throughout the city for drainage. But this is all going to be paid for. So I think a good chunk of this money should go for the water and sewer projects that Mr. Phil may be proposing. One of them, I think, is the uh, replacement of mains. Again, we have to pay for these programs. It's for the benefit. And not only does the uh, sewer and water is one of the categories the government is advocating, many of you may not think so, but one of the categories is public health. You don't have clean water and you don't have the proper sewage, you're not going to have public health. So it falls under two categories in the program, I believe, although they may not say so. But uh, also, if we invest in some of these programs that are shovel ready, that ready to roll, it's going to benefit the residents, the taxpayers, business, every category in the city. And it's also going to benefit them in year one, two, and it's going to benefit them in year 19 and 20, where their rates didn't go up to pay for these programs. With that, I thank you and hope the best for the city. Thank you, uh, Paul. I mean, uh, John Furlan. Thank you. Uh, next up on the list is Attorney Raina Brown. Hi everybody, I'm Rena Brown. I'm a resident of Fall River, taxpayer, small business owner, but more importantly, I'm an active member of 12-step uh, uh, fellowships here in Fall River, and uh, it's a hat I wear proudly. I'm a member of long-term recovery from substance abuse disorder. What that means is we don't ever get cured, we just keep that disease at bay a day at a time. And I, um, I'm sure you all know, you know, most of the services for mental health and substance abuse disorder, alcoholism, however you want to call it, um, are funded by nonprofits. And 2020 was a horrible year for nonprofits. I'll echo uh, Joanne's uh, statement. Uh, nonprofits uh, are funded by donations. And almost all the nonprofits that I've either served on the board for or wish I could serve on the board for uh, couldn't have their fundraisers in 2020. And without funding, they can't offer the services that they've offered uh, the last few decades. You know, a lot of our great nonprofits in the city, Townhouse, Star, Stepping Stone, I mean, you know, the Vets Kitchen, there's a, there's a ton of them in the city. And I want to talk about not just the nonprofits that are 501c qualified, you know, but there's grassroots nonprofits that don't have the funding be to become 501c3. It takes a lot of money to become a 501c3. I'm talking about some of the grassroots nonprofits haven't been able to get funding. And uh, so, you know, I want you guys to dig deep when nonprofits come knocking on the door, but I think that it fills a few um, categories um, to think about these nonprofits and how they have suffered throughout 2020. Um, a lot of their fundraising, you know, and I'll talk about Stepping Stone because I'm not on the board and it's not a conflict, but they did a, a big walk every August that raised, uh, you know, tens of thousands of dollars for their programs. 
And uh, I don't prefer one nonprofit over the other. I like them all across the board. If they're helping addicts stay clean, if they're keeping alcoholics from drinking, I'm all for it. But they suffered immensely because 2020 was the year that they didn't get the funding they needed. And a lot of these nonprofits, especially the grassroots, uh, aren't 501c3, so they didn't qualify for PPE money either. So, you know, there's a lot of them out there. Um, one of the things I'd like you to consider when you're parceling out the, these millions is that Fall River has some great neighborhood associations. Neighborhood associations that don't get any funding from the city um, and neighborhood associations like the Corky Row Neighborhood Association that only become newsworthy when two young people lose their lives in that neighborhood. So, you know, I think our neighborhood associations are great outreach programs that with a little funding from this money would be able to go out into those neighborhoods and educate them on other programs in the city. Um, I'll tell you, I spent this past year, um, uh, you know, consulting with clients that lost, lost loved ones because of COVID. And I didn't see the category up here for legal needs, but I, I think it would come under social services. Many families don't know what to do when a family member dies. And a lot of them couldn't go up to the hospital to make funeral arrangements, burial arrangements. A lot of them had family members that were in comas and they didn't know about guardianships. Um, and a lot of them couldn't afford the filing fees. So I don't know where that comes. I would say social services. But I, I, you know, it's time that as a community we offer more to the people that don't have the money for filing fees. You know, um, it costs money to go to court and file for guardianship unless you ask for a waiver. But no, but people don't know their legal rights. They don't know their legal rights for evictions. And I'm not looking for a job and I don't want anybody to call my office and come ask me. I'm just saying that a lot of people came seeking legal assistance and couldn't get it because they didn't have the money to. Um, and I think, and, and it just brings me back, these neighborhood associations could offer, um, you know, at their neighborhood meetings a night where people that live in that neighborhood come and get some direction. You know, where do I go to find this stuff out? You know, educate, educate, educate. Um, we have some beautiful parks in the city and uh, nonprofits have to pay a fee to use the pavilion at Kennedy Park. I'd like to see the con city consider giving nonprofits you know, fee waivers for using their parks or having events. You gotta pay a fee for anything you wanna do uh, just about in the city. And these nonprofits are coming out of a bad year. The food pantry needs money. The vet's kitchen needs money. And you know, a lot of these organizations are not 501c3s. And when I say that, it's just the IRS designates, you know, a grassroots business as being tax exempt. And a lot of programs won't let you apply for money if you're not a 501c3. And it costs a ton of money to become a 501c3. So, you know, uh, there's programs like Riveter Recovery who just expanded, you know, to offer more services for people that are suffering from substance abuse disorder, mental health diagnoses. You know, in case you didn't know, overdoses increased during the pandemic. And we don't talk about overdoses because the pandemic was so deadly every day, but I am telling you that so is substance abuse disorder, so is alcoholism, that people are still dying from that, and we still need to pay attention to those other deadly epidemics. Thank you. Thank you, Attorney Brown. We are on page two, and I'd like to recognize Kathy Castro from FRAC. Good evening, everyone. I'm here to advocate for the arts and culture in Fall River. Uh, FRAC was formed three years ago uh, with myself, Nick Chris, the president of uh, Bankos Bank, and Bill Eccles, at that time, the president of Bank Five, because it was felt that a, a uh, umbrella organization was needed in Fall River to pull the arts together. So we've done that over these past three years. We're in the process now of issuing, within the next couple of months, a plan for the city, we were lucky enough to get money to do that, uh, to pay for that uh, group from Boston to put together this plan. And we have elicited and solicited monies, uh, other monies, as well as input from the community. So I would like, what I would like to do is share with you tonight 
uh, some figures that were provided by Mass Creative. Mass Creative is an organization, an advocacy organization for the arts in Massachusetts. Uh, and before I start this, I'd just like to acknowledge some of our members here tonight. Joanne Sprager, whom you've met, Patrick Norton, Patty Rigo, Elena Pavid, one of our important members from the mayor's office in Fall River, and also uh, Asia Reese, who is here too from the Diversity Committee for the City. So I acknowledge all of them, very happy to see their support here tonight. Uh, in Massachusetts, cultural nonprofits support more than 73,000 full-time jobs, generate over 2.38 million in total spending and bring in nearly 100 million in state tax revenues. In 2018, there were more than 21 million attendees for an art and cultural event in the greater Boston area, which is more than four times that for all major sporting events combined. In Lowell, arts and cultural nonprofits support 500 full-time jobs generate over 12 million in total spending and bring in 478 or a half million dollars in total revenue. In Springfield, arts and cultural nonprofits support 1,857 full-time jobs, generate nearly 50 million in total spending and bring in 2.2 in local tax revenues. And in Worcester, which is often compared with Fall River, Arts and cultural nonprofits support 4,000 full-time jobs and generate over 12 million in total spending. They bring in 4.4 million in local tax revenue. So I put forth that not only are the arts and cultural organizations in Fall River of primary importance, I would say they are the future of the city. So we ask for your support for them. Thank you. Thank you, Kathy. Uh, my next two names, I don't know if you'd like to come up together, but I have Jack Flynn and Sarah Fisk from the Watupa Rowing Center. We get six minutes and we can You got it. <laughs> Hi, my name's Jack Flynn. Hello, Jack. Thank you for having us with this opportunity right here. I'm with the Watupa Rowing Center. Um, Watupa Rowing Center is a new community organization. It's a nonprofit 501c3 uh, organization. Um, we've been around since 2018. Uh, we were originally Bay Coast Rowing, and we are now rebranded as Watupa Rowing Center. So we are uh, focused on youth from ages 12 and up. Um, we offer rowing on the water and during the winter and off season uh, indoors in our facility that we lease from the city right now. What I'm gonna talk about is um, what we're looking for is we don't have water, running water or sewer. So we're looking to tie in to the sewer system with the city and running water for um, that facility. One part about that is that we need to have a handicapped bathroom because in addition to the youth program that we have, we also have programs for veterans and part of that program is a program for para-athletes. And it's not just para-athletes that are veterans, it's for all para-athletes that have a physical disability. Um, when you do have physical disabilities, it can lead to mental health issues, this is another pathway out into building better mental health, not just for those athletes, but also for kids. Another thing that our organization does for the kids is it does allow for potential greater post-secondary um, opportunities with college as far as competitive rowing. Some of the things that our students or our, our athletes do learn is teamwork, um, healthy mental and physical fitness. They learn leadership and we also want to provide mentorship, which is huge for all children in every city. Um, Sarah's going to bring up, uh, she's one of our coaches at Watupa, and Sarah has a few things that she would like to speak about as well. Hi, guys. I'm normally speaking in a loudspeaker, telling people, sit up straight, pull hard, power town, let's go, guys. So um, 
sorry if I like tell you to watch your elbow position here. But I am new to the area. I'm actually, I'm a Rhode Island native and left for a while and returned recently. And first, I just want to say um, something really impressive about Fall River, which I uh, feel like, I guess it sounds like maybe you guys don't hear all that much, but I have been amazed by the community element here. And I'm not exaggerating. Um, my family is actually here with me right now because I dragged them out because I'm like, check it out. Like people come here and people care. So you guys really care about it. We have members of the board like Jack and tons of other people. Some of them have never set foot in a boat. Jack has, but some of these people, they don't care about rowing. They care about Fall River. They care about the youth. They care about the community. And I've heard so many ideas out here that do. Um, what we do is amazing. Rowing can transform people's lives. Sport can transform people's lives. It can pay for college educations, but it can just take somebody from not having a purpose to having a purpose. I recently listened to a podcast with them. Um, a guy, maybe you've seen the most beautiful thing movie that came out. It was about the first all black rowing team in Chicago. But the coach there said something that drew him to the sport and it really resonated with me. And that's that it's competitive, but non-combative. And that's something that's so important for urban youth who maybe have grown up in a little bit of a combative, combative environment. And he made this joke. He said um, he couldn't play football because it was too, um, to PTSD from fights and everything. And he couldn't play basketball because the trash talk just made him want to you know, get in a fight. But it's really hard to trash talk someone when you're rowing. You call that, a, a, excuse me, right? So you get the idea. So rowing is great for that. All of these things that you guys have mentioned, building up youth, helping the community, they all, uh, we do all of those things. But something that's affecting us and that's affecting the greater Fall River community is the state of where we row on the South Wotepa Pond. Um, the water right now is green. There's an algae bloom that's been a problem for a long time. You guys maybe have seen in the newspaper that it's, you can't swim in it. You can't drink it. I wouldn't recommend drinking it even if it wasn't green, but um, it's bad. We have parks, we have kayakers, we have fishermen, we have um, speed boats, we have jet skis, we have paddle boarders. Right now the city is actually making a nice picnic area right next to it. Your boy Loco mentioned Dave's Beach, right? That's Amwatepa Pond. Let's like, get his idea there. Let's get a nice beach and a nice recreation area, but let's not have it with green water. Um, so this algae bloom, this cyanoalgae bloom, we need some money to clean up that pond. It's gonna infect everybody. And when we can clean it up, we can get more business, both through the rowing club, bringing in people for races, through bike paths, through the beach and everything else. Um, but with a green pond, we can't do it. So we need consultants to come in and look at it. There, there have been some studies done on it. And there's some things that you can do about the pond, but it really needs to be cleaned up. It's a beautiful natural resource. It's a treasure of Fall River, but it's becoming a hazard. So that's my two cents. Thanks. <laughs> I want to thank both of you and you do great work. I actually followed your Instagram account, so thanks again for coming. Um, next on the list is uh, a neighbor of mine, John Sylvia. I thought this was going to be a little more informal, so I wanted to stay out there so I could talk to you guys because you're gonna make the decisions. Um, we know Fall River, we're getting folks in here that are paying four and $500,000 for houses now. So we have a middle class in here. We wanna keep the middle class. So what should we do? We need to bring in things that they want. We have the Watapa, um, the um, Quickishan Rail Trail. What I'd like to see there, and this is something that wasn't new when the, uh, when the um, plans came out for that, to put kayaks in there, paddle boats. And you know what, maybe have uh, teenagers work there have me an ice cream stand or somebody come in that would be something that the teens and everybody could see when you're going on 185 you'll see the kayakers you'll see the paddle boats and people will get off the highway if you ever go to the uh, bike trail in uh, in Warren they have like a little ice cream stand there and it's packed all the time another thing that uh, I'd like to see is more trees improve the aesthetics that's something that everybody is going to you know, get something out of it. If we do something about traffic islands, plant trees all over the place. I mean, New Bedford plants 500 trees a year out of their budget. If we could do that, it's gonna calm things down. It's gonna help on, you know, air conditioning, heating. But again, that's something, I mean, everybody had great ideas here, but that's something that everybody could appreciate. 
So I'd like to see that. And, you know, again, um, just trying to think of ways to improve the aesthetics. You know, people move out to Westport, to Fairhaven. Why do they move out there? For the aesthetics, you know, and everything being calm. Um, maybe think of ways, too, with the traffic, to slow down the traffic. I live on a main road, and it's absolutely crazy. So I think with trees or maybe realigning parking spaces, that would be helpful as, uh, as well. Um, but that's my two cents. I'm just a regular citizen here. I'm not part of any group. I am part of a nonprofit, two groups, an able group and the tree planting. But I just wanted to give my sense as a regular citizen what I think we should do. We don't have money to ever do that. We don't have money for trees. Plant, Fall River has planted zero trees in the last 10 years. That was done by the nonprofit, the Fall River Street Tree Planting Group. They do fundraising, and they're the ones that have planted it. I'm not blaming Fall River or anything, but this is what we need to spend the money on, things that we don't, that we'll never spend it on, you know, if we, if, through the budget. So, thank you. Before I call up our last uh, speaker, I just want to put my two cents in tonight. Uh, I can't tell you how gratifying and rewarding it was to see this turnout tonight, um, and I want to express my thanks. I know we did earlier. Um, I've been on your side of the table in these type of meetings, uh, and this side of the table. I've been a president of the neighborhood association. I've been a CYO baseball coach, a CYO basketball coach, a advocate for schools, an advocate for John Boyd Center, you know, an advocate for, uh, for housing and whatnot. So I want to thank all of you. The other thing that impresses me so much about the crowd tonight is how many folks are willing to come up and, um, and not necessarily look for something solely for themselves, but in typical Fall River fashion, they're looking for help to help others in need, to help others less fortunate, whether it's youth programs or whether it's infrastructure, um, or whether you're here helping your son. Um, and speaking on behalf of your son. So, uh, but you know, this is, again, it's, it's right up my alley. Um, it's right up the mayor's alley. I can't wait till he can watch this. Uh, tomorrow morning, and again, I want to thank you all, and it makes me proud and honored to be a, a lifelong citizen of this, uh, of this beautiful city. Um, last speaker is uh, City Council Linda Pereira. I want to encourage everyone again, please complete your surveys. They are important, or any additional comments, um, you can leave them with Elena. Michael Dion from Community Development is at the door. Um, they are important and they're appreciated. So please um, fill out those uh, fill out those surveys for us. Thank you so much, Councilor Pereira. It's Linda. Yes, I am your servant. That's how I see my role as a city councilor. I am so delighted to have come here tonight to hear all the positive suggestions that people have made. The Row Center. I have had a meeting with them because since 1992, I've been trying to get Dave's Beach done. Right now, if you go to the gates, where the ramp is, take a right, and you will see the picnic area. And I would urge you and Mr. Aguiar to go by. Even after this, I'll go by with you. We have 17 picnic benches, two of them handicap accessible. The city put in pads for us to put the picnic tables on and a walkway so handicapped individuals can get there. Call nursing homes, give people a day out to go there. And if the row center needs a handicapped bathroom and they need um, water and sewer, let's partner. That's why I went and met with you folks to partner. You wanted me to get in that boat. I think I'm a little too wide for that boat. But, um, you know, I, I look at that. I've met with Kathy Castro and a group there, and I've met with the Dennis's as well. I have another meeting coming up with um, Attorney Atkins, because I have suggested that we need a tourism director. How many of you know or knew before today about the Rose Center? How many know that they have yoga at one of the parks? They have Zumba at another park for free. Um, I wanted to do last year, Four Rivers Got Talent, a child, children 16 to 18, express their talent. I'm working with Cherie Taylor from the school department, and the grand prize will be an automobile. Uh, or what do they call them now? Pre-owned, see when I was a kid it was a used car. Now they're pre-owned to do that. Or Fall River celebrates diversity. 
Think about us all going down to Heritage State Park. Look at every single culture we have in Fall River. Bring a sampling of your food. Bring a sampling, set up the stage, bring a sampling of your music or whatever. Let's all get to know one another. And what impressed me most tonight was everybody talking about the different things that they're willing to do. I mean, when, when I worked with a group of people, I don't do anything alone. You are more empowered when you get people together. The Vietnam War was a perfect example. Two and a half years we were on that. Finally, it was done because a group of people worked together and didn't fight apart. And that's what I loved to see. And I want to thank so many of you for coming forward with your ideas. I've also talked to Mr. Lima. I also had a meeting with Brian Pearson and back there, uh, Mr. Kuzik, because you want to expand the bike path. So we want it to come right across. I've talked to Paul Schmidt. Let's get a, a bridge there. Come right across from Brayton Avenue, right in to Dave's Beach, to the picnic area, to the Rose Center. So with, they're working on that now. It's just if you work together, you get so much more done. And honestly, from the bottom of my heart, thank you all for just giving such good input and ideas because negativity in this community gives me agonia, which is ajada, which is just really irks me because we in Fall River care about Fall River. And that's the number one thing I've got out of this meeting tonight, is how much our people care about our community. Thank you all for coming. Thank you. Folks, just again, final thank yous. Thank you to you. I wanna, I wanna say thanks to all of you. I wanna say thanks to FRG TV, Fred TV, uh, a Fall River police officer who was here, uh, Tony Rogericks and Our Lady of Light Band Club for being uh, so generous. Uh, and Fall River Reporter for bringing it out to the community. So again, thank you all. If I mistakenly forgot anyone, again, I apologize. And I'd also like to thank our dedicated uh, advisory panel here. So I appreciate their time. Uh, this is meeting uh, number three, and I'm sure we're gonna have a few more. So thank you all, drive safe, have a great night. <laughs>